to Black Nouveau. This is our edition for March 9th, 2016. I'm Joanne Williams. It began as a picture book, then became a play with gospel music. We'll hear an excerpt from Crowns and talk with the director. It's currently at Milwaukee's Skylight Music Theater. Milwaukee's Legal Aid Society was founded in 1916 with the mission, Do All Things Necessary for the Prevention of Injustice. Years. We'll talk with the society's executive director. You know, Robert Townsend has a long and impressive list of movies and television shows that he directed, produced, or starred in. But it was his classic Hollywood shuffle that brought him to the Oriental Theater. Now here's a question. What are the connections between race, justice, and the economy? The answer? Everything. Economist Julianne Malvo told us why and offered some tips on how to succeed in business. For its annual event to promote racial justice and equality, the Milwaukee YWCA brought nationally known economist Julianne Malvo to the city. When the media want the opinions of a black economist, they call Julianne Malvo. And I think everything is economic. Economics is a study of who gets what, when, where, and why. And those are really the questions that we continue to ask ourselves. I mean, politics is the same thing, but from a different basis. It's how you're dividing the pie. She has a Ph.D. in economics from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, is developing her own talk show, and is the former president of Bennett College in North Carolina. I really want young African Americans to understand that we have participated in the economy, and we've been very effective in some ways in participating in the economy. African American people are treated as if uh, we're economic outsiders, like we're like the kid with our nose to the candy store and don't necessarily have access. But we know full well that there have been cases of access. Uh, there have been cases of change with A. Philip Randolph, cases of uh, organizing people like Mary McLeod Bethune, founding a university with a dollar and 50 cents. So we could call you know, much of the role and say there, have been, there has been participation. Now, has there been equal participation? No. But we do want to know who those famous folks are who've done things as role models. And we want to know what movements have been to inspire us to do other things. There is a resistance uh, to African-American history. There is a resistance to anything, frankly, that's empowering. We talked about the major themes that she discusses in the media these days, knowing our history, and how to make the economic system work for black Americans. She says that even if all factors are equal, Racial discrimination still sneaks in. I mean, there are economists who believe that you have unemployment differentials because black people simply aren't prepared enough. I wrote my doctoral dissertation on unemployment differentials by race and occupation because at that time, Carter was president, the argument was that black folks were in the wrong occupations. So if we were in the same occupations that whites were in, in the same proportions, the thought was that our unemployment rate would be lower. The fact is that it was lower, but there still was a differential um, of about a third, and I call that the race effect. So after you've controlled for education, you've controlled for um, age, you've controlled for everything else, you still had a level that was unexplained. Is that still the case today? Uh, yes, it is. Um, I haven't run the data recently, but I ran it about 10 years ago and it was still the same, and you will still see an unemployment differential. Uh, the unemployment rate currently is 5 point, maybe 5.1, 5.2. The unemployment rate for African Americans is 9.2 percent. Now we have seen a significant decline in the unemployment rate under President Obama, but you still have that gap between African Americans and whites, and we've had that gap really as long as we've counted these numbers. Your subject is economy, race, and justice. How are they connected? It's a distribution issue. Uh, what we know about race and the economy is that you have African-American people who basically are not players. African-Americans own probably a third as many small businesses as others do. Um, African-American economic participation in terms of the labor market is different. As you mentioned here in Milwaukee, the black un male unemployment rate is near 50 percent. That's not very different from the rest of the country especially given, um, basically given this recession. There are plenty of people in Milwaukee who would like to be their own boss, but Malvo says they have to follow the rules. Number one, make sure you have the right team. 
Just don't get up one day and say, I'm going to start a business. You need an attorney. You need an accountant. Make sure that you have those people on your team. So number two, make sure you worked to have access to capital. Now, it's more difficult now than it might have been a generation ago because so much banking is automated because so people are not necessarily developing those personal relationships. But I'd say, you know, look for a banker. Look for someone that you can work with who might be able to cut a corner or two for you. Then I would say follow the rules. I mean, they may be unevenly applied, but you still got to follow the rules. And that's just, you know, that's just how it is. So, you know, I'd, so be prepared. And that's why you have an accountant. And that's why you have a lawyer, because those folks are going to say, excuse me, did you file that piece of information? The other thing I would say to folks is look long term. Um, do you have a lifestyle business or a legacy business? A lifestyle business pretty much supports you. When you uh, retire, pass on, whatever, you're not leaving much. A legacy business, you have typically designed to leave something. Don't be afraid to allow people to invest in your business. We often, we want our own thing. I want my business. Well, it might be effective to have one merged business as opposed to five small businesses. Since 1916, the Legal Aid Society of Milwaukee has been providing free legal assistance to needy Milwaukee County residents with civil legal problems. Kimberly Walker is the Society's Executive Director. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Great. So, um, first question, uh, what types of services do you provide and who are your clients? So, the Legal Aid Society of Milwaukee provides free civil legal services to Milwaukee's poor and we provide a full range of civil legal services from landlord-tenant matters, we represent abused and neglected children, we work with immigration matters, so all things civil. Okay. Um, what type of civil action do you see the most? I don't know if I could say we see anything um, the most. I will say that about 60 percent of what we do is to represent children in our guardian at litem program. And so we have um, staff who provide um, services to the children that are out at the Watertown Plank Building, as well as attorneys who provide services to children downtown. So that would be the majority. Follow that, I would say that we do a lot of landlord-tenant matters. Like evictions? Yes, evictions. Uh, we deal with foreclosure matters, uh, tax controversies, all, all things civil. Okay. Yeah. Um, how do poor people, how do they get in touch with you? How do they access your services? Well, the unfortunate and fortunate reality is that the Legal Aid Society does not do any kind of advertising. It's really by word of mouth and by people referring um, the low income to us. We provide um, outreach clinics to various sites without, throughout the community, as well as we have two offices, the Watertown Plank office and we have a new, relatively new office off of James Lovell Street. So anyone who's looking to have assistance from a civil legal perspective can come to our James Lovell office on a Monday or Wednesday between 1.30 and 3.30 and have their legal matter reviewed and provided there's no conflict and everything checks out from a financial standpoint, they will be uh, able to talk to an attorney. Are you say, able to serve all the needy? Absolutely not. Unfortunately, the need so greatly outweighs what we're able to provide. Um, even though we are able to provide services to about 8,000 of Milwaukee's poorest residents, we still turn away several thousand each year. Wow. So where do they go when you turn them down? What we do is if we are not able to provide services, we give them as much legal advice as we can or we do a referral. So we will refer to other low-income um, organizations. How is Legal Aid Society different from Legal Action in Wisconsin? There's a lot of overlap, and that's a question that a lot of people have. Um, folks confuse us quite often. So the funding source is the major difference. The Legal Action of uh, Wisconsin is an LSC-funded organization. We get our funds from private organizations, from public organizations, from um, individual law firms and individuals. We don't have any LSC funding. So as an example, United Way of Greater Milwaukee and Waukesha County, they have been a funding source of ours since 1916. 
So you, you just don't fight for the rights of the um, you know individual. You also fight against big businesses. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. We fight against <laughs> big businesses and corporations. Most notably, probably, uh, folks will know about our... It's called the Wisconsin Auto Title Loan Matter, where we went up against these predatory lenders that were providing these um, exorbitant loans, interest loans, to the low income and offering a service that really wasn't there. We got a significant settlement that uh, came down in 2015 of about $17.5 million. And so we go after all kinds of unfair actions. Um, how do people access your services? What do they do? So if you have access to a computer, you can go online and look to see what kind of services you want. Otherwise, you can give us a call on our number, which is 414-727-5300, and talk to a person about coming in on a Monday and Wednesday. And it's an intake. It's first come, first serve. You do not have to make an appointment to come in. You just bring all of your documentation. And again, provided that uh, certain criteria are met, they will be able to talk to an attorney. Now, 100 years yes. being in service. Uh, how do you keep your staff motivated after 100 years? Do you get sick of hearing about the same problems? Is, is, is that an issue for you? I would say that having the same issue come up again and again is the problem. We don't ever get tired of seeing clients coming in. But the fact that 100 years later we're still dealing with some of the same issues that existed 100 years ago, that is a little disheartening. So, yes, 100 years. Um, we actually are celebrating our 100-year uh, anniversary luncheon on September 13th at um, the Potawatomi this year, so all are welcome to come. It'll be a premier event of about 750 lawyers, judges, professionals in the community. Oh, so it's open to the public. It is open to the public. Tickets will go on sale in June, and so you should come. How do we get tickets? Uh, tickets will be made available on our website, and then also we will do a general mailing to all of the state of Wisconsin and the law firms and individuals. So w more information can be found on our website, www.lasmilwaukee.com. Perfect. Hey, thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Thank you. Robert Townsend didn't act like the big-time movie star that he is. He burst through the crowd, smiling and willing to shake hands and talk to anybody. The Milwaukee Film Festival featured his groundbreaking movie, Hollywood Shuffle, as the centerpiece of its Black Lens series. Eight movies by black filmmakers that would not be able to be seen in a true classic movie theater like this anywhere else. Hollywood Shuffle was done in 12 days, over two and a half years. Uh, 12 of the hardest days of my life. You talk about... Uh, scouting locations, running from the police, you know, if the police couldn't see us, it was a good location. Um, all my friends, one of my uh, friends in the back uh, started producing a movie with me, Mr. Bobby McGee, he's gonna come up here and talk to me afterwards. <laughs> Mr. McGee in the back. Um, the film was done in part, I had $60,000 in the bank, I had just finished a movie called The Soldier Story, and I told my agent, I said, I wanna do more movies like this, you know, it was directed by Norman Jewis, and it was me, Denzel, Adolph Caesar, Howard Rollins, and my agent said, they only do one black movie a year, Robert, and you just did it. And I auditioned for The Color Purple, and I didn't get the part of Harfold, so I missed my black movie. So I decided I would make my own movie. And so Hollywood Shuffle was the first time I ever directed, picked up the camera. And um, so tonight, uh, you know, I, I'm proud of this movie, uh, and I hope you enjoy it for some of you that have not seen it. And uh, we're going to have a discussion afterwards. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is Hollywood Shuffle. What we're looking for is an Eddie Murphy type. What is happening with your cool vines? Thank you. Thank you. You're the worst actor I've ever seen in my life. Then they said I wasn't black enough for the part. Ricky, can you tell us what you've been doing since you've graduated? Well, Robert, I've played nine crooks. Four gang leaders, two dope dealers. I played a rapist twice. Whoa. That was fun. They'll never play the Rambos until they stop playing the Sambo. Yeah! I would say that Hollywood Shuffle is my journey as a young actor of color in Hollywood. The obstacles that I had to face, um, semi-autobiographical, and uh, I think it's very funny, you know, because we got funny people in it, and it's a touching story, too. What's changed in 2014? Um, 
I, th I think there have been a lot of changes in Hollywood. Uh, when I think about Shonda Rhimes and I think about her doing Scandal and then now the new show, How to Get Away with Murder, Denzel right now is one of the biggest stars in Hollywood in terms of the box office. So we've made a lot of inroads, but you know there's still more work to be done. What I tell new filmmakers is technology makes it so affordable to make a movie, to make a short film, to do anything is just conquering the fear. I think what holds a lot of people back is fear. They're afraid that they may fail instead of understanding that anything you do is a lesson that you can learn from. Take the lesson. So failure is something good? Failure is a necessary brick for success, you know, because you learn more when you go like, okay, why didn't it work? Okay, oh man, I had to rewrite that. I had to re-edit that. Oh, I, that wasn't the right scene. I need to reshoot it. So if you can be patient, because I believe there are no accidents. I just think that sometimes, you know, you're being delayed because there's a bigger blessing at the end of the rainbow. His buddy and sometimes producing partner, Bobby McGee, the one wearing the orange badge, had not been to Milwaukee before. Townsend, from the west side of Chicago, is familiar with Brewtown. In fact, he shared a very personal story about an earlier visit. I had a very emotional moment when I was in Milwaukee. I was here, and they were honoring me for something. I can't remember what it was. I want to say about 15 years ago. And it was some kind of dinner and this woman sang a song to me, A Hero Comes Along. And she's here tonight, and she sang this song, and I started crying like a baby, because it was just like the way she sang it, and it was kind of like my father was uh, not in my life when I was a kid. He was a good guy, but he just wanted to run the streets. And uh, when she sang that song, it reminded me of my father, because on his deathbed, you know, I, I, I took care of him, and it was like he said, I wish I would have got to know you better. You know, I wish I would have gotten, you know, and it was like at that time, and it just felt, and she sang that song, so I had this big moment in uh, Milwaukee. Robert Townsend seems to be constantly working. He has three projects underway this fall, including one that takes him off the screen and back onto the stage for a series of live performances. Um, there's a film that I finished called Playing for Love, and we're close to distribution. I shot it in Miami last year. Um, with myself, Sally Richardson, uh, Lawrence Hilton Jacobs, uh, Isai Morales. Um, uh, Thanksgiving, I'm, I just finished directing Bill Cosby on his next comedy special. It's going to be on Netflix. It premieres uh, Thanksgiving. And then I've been working on a one-man show about my life, like all those movies and my whole journey. So I just did that in San Francisco. I workshopped that um, two weeks ago, and then I'll be back up there doing it in January. That's kind of risky, isn't it? A show yeah. about your life? It's really, it's, it's, it's scary, it's frightening, um, and it's all true. You know, I died a couple of times. I wasn't supposed to be here on a lot of levels. You know, so it's my journey. You know what I mean? Because you'll see the body of work there, but I'm a kid that came from a really rough neighborhood on the west side of Chicago with gangs everywhere, and I ran down the Rona alleys a couple of times, but you know God was always watching over me. So it's kind of my journey, and then dealing with Hollywood and all the stuff I've been through, dealing with all these Hollywood type of people. That can be just as treacherous as the alleys in Chicago. Oh yeah, same alleys, <laughs> just different wardrobe. <laughs> Should the shadows come? And why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home? And I 
That's one of the gospel songs you're going to hear in Crowns. It's playing at Milwaukee Skylight Music Theater through March 26th. Sherry Williams Pinnell is the director, and she joins us now. Welcome. Thank you so much, Joanne. I'm so glad to be here. Well, glad you're here. Who were the performers we heard? You heard Raven Dockery, who, who is Velma in our production, and our music director, Chasmine Williams Ali. Now, tell us a little bit about Crowns. I know it started off as a picture book. It was a picture book with um, photographs by uh, Michael Cunningham and the stories that were collected about these beautiful women and their crowns um, by uh, Craig Marbury. Regina Taylor was so inspired by what she saw, she wrote a play. Um, the book was published in 1998, the play in 2005, and then it evolved into this beautiful musical. Again, Regina Taylor's inspiration. Now, I remember when the book was published, you said it was 95, so that's not that long ago. Not that long ago, no. And for it to evolve from a book to a play to a musical, yes. that's pretty fast. It is fast, but look at the stories. They're so compelling. Each woman is inspired uh, by the memory attached to a hat, a church hat, or a hat that is worn only for a special occasion. Maybe it's a wedding or it's a funeral, but it is a hat that has a history attached to it and an investment very expensive, and yet you may only see it once or twice so <laughs> in, a, in a lifetime of a woman. <laughs> That's true. Yes. So what's the story of Crowns? In our story, there is a young girl, 16-year-old Yolanda, who has, like a lot of young people today, suffered a great loss. And this in her brother, who dies uh, through a very tragic incident. And I don't want to give it away, because when you come, you'll hear her story. But her family is very concerned about her, and they send her to someone they believe can help heal her soul and help her find herself again. And that's her grandmother, Elsie Shaw, who is in Darlington, South Carolina. So our story begins in Brooklyn, and then we travel to Darlington, South Carolina, where there are a group of women who are described as uh, spirits or prayer warriors, each woman representing a different color, a different energy. Um, who comes together along with Mother Shaw on the behalf of Yolanda. So it sounds like a beautiful story. It is. Uh, who, who's in the show that we're going to recognize? You'll know everyone, Joanne, because they're all from Milwaukee. Um, Cynthia Cobb, Yuna Vanduval, uh, Malkia Stampley, Raven Dockery, who you heard, Tasha McCoy, Ashley Levels, and the one man in the cast, Ron Lee. They are all Milwaukeeans, and we can be proud of their performance. When I come to the show, uh -huh. uh, what do you want me to take away? That there is a healing power to people coming together on the behalf of one member of the community, combining those forces of prayer, of music, that there is humor in the healing process as well, that through humor, through prayer and faith, we can survive almost anything. And, and, and when I come to the show, or when anybody comes to the show, <laughs> yes. do we have to wear a hat? 
you may indeed wear your crown, but if your crown is so large that people around you are not able to see the show, <laughs> please be kind and remove your crown and place it in your lap. In fact, when you come to the theater, you will see, I'll say, very humorous um, advertisements that encourage the sisters and the, the gents as well to remove their large crowns. All right. Well, <laughs> I won't wear my largest, but I'll wear yeah. something appropriate. All Sherry, right. Thank you so much for coming and talking okay. with us today about crowns, playing at the Skylight Music Theater through March 26th. And thank you, Joanne. Here are the four viewers who will receive tickets to see crowns courtesy of the Skylight Music Theater. They knew that Regina Taylor won a Golden Globe and an NAACP Image Award for her role on the TV show, I'll Fly Away. Finally tonight, on March 16th, National Public Radio host Michelle Martin will moderate a candid and wide-ranging conversation on race in America. It will feature two of public television's most prolific contributors, Ken Burns and Henry Louis Gates. Both have new programs that discuss the issue of race in America. The event will take place at the Brooklyn Academy of Music's Howard Gilman Opera House and will be streamed live by PBS. You can link to the live stream on Milwaukee Public Television's website, www.mptv.org, next Wednesday, March 16th at 7 p.m. And that's our program for this week. For Black Nouveau, I'm Joanne Williams. Thanks for watching.